So good morning. Uh, Carl, we were doing some last minute diddling with the slides and forgot what time it was. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be covering several things today. Um, ACE receptor updates, uh, some new studies involving ivermectin, a uh, parasite drug. Uh, new Zealand, are they squashing the curve? And um, continued development on the ACE receptor updates, uh, the ACE receptor uh, medications, ACE inhibitors, uh, ARBs. Um, and then we'll have our major uh, item for today, the silver linings on COVID-19. But we will get to that right after uh, Carl's intro. So there was a, an article in the, I think it's the Washington Post, is the New England not flattening the, I mean, New Zealand, not just flattening the curve, but squashing it. They've got four weeks of lockdown, including no uh, hunting, uh, not hunting, no hunting in the bush there, and massive public response to call in or call out those people who are not following lockdown and call the, um, the police to come uh, deal with them. So major public response, and that appears to be uh, having a huge impact on transmission within New Zealand. So, you know what? Again, it always goes back to that old comment. You ask for whom the bell tolls, and it tolls for us. And we can blame our leaders. We can blame our lack of tools. We can blame a whole lot of things. But uh, when the when the society is involved and actually acting responsibly we can usually get a lot of stuff done. ACE, uh, ACE uh, receptors, ACE inhibitors and uh, uh, angiotensin receptor blockers. I keep mentioning that because there's a lot of focus on these right now because of the early warning that, oh my goodness, we think that uh, ACEs and ARBs, um, ACE inhibitors and ARBs may be increasing risk for this disease. The, the pendulum has swung at this point and the, I've seen several articles, bottom line, there does appear to be balanced impact of two competing mechanisms. One is more of an inflammatory type of mechanism uh, where you're getting uh, some pro-inflammation uh, process, but more of uh, maybe potentially uh, increasing the susceptibility to infection. However, by f when I say the pendulum is swinging, the vast majority of folks are saying, look, uh, the anti-inflammatory mechanisms are, of the ARBs and the ACE inhibitors, which are the big things that have been uh, been helpful about these drugs and so helpful about them for um, diabetes. Those things are, uh, most people are beginning to think, those probably outweigh any uh, potential negative effects. Bottom line, everybody's still saying the same thing. We don't know completely yet, but... The other bottom line is, what do you do now? Don't go off your uh, ARBs or your ACE inhibitors. I haven't gone off of mine. You ever hear of ivermectin? It's a parasite drug. Uh, they're doing trials on them now. And how does that work? Ivermectin basically decreases the ability of the COVID-19 virus, coronavirus, to hijack our genetic mechanisms. It can't get into the nucleus of the cell. And if it can't get in there, it can't really hijack the, uh, the mechanism. Another interesting point, not, it's not something that's, uh, that's not predicted. In fact, I've said it many, many times, as, a, um, as a, an epidemic or pandemic um, continues to grow from nothing to getting good data, we start getting information about the denominator. What does the denominator mean? Well, when a virus like coronavirus come, first comes out, you don't see the people that have few or no um, symptoms. So there's some data coming out recently in Germany. 2% were infected, but 16% already appeared to have antibody present. So what that's meaning is the denominator, 
the people that have had infection, but none of us knew it, is appearing to be much greater. Now, what's the good news on that? Well, again, and that's where we're starting to get some of that lower case fatality rate. In fact, from, if you see from this headline, the case fatality rate they picked from their numbers was closer to, was more like less than half a percent. Now, do I think that's the reality? Maybe not so, not so fast. But again, this is a totally predictable development as you get an improvement in the denominator. In other words, how many people have really been infected? All of those asymptomatics are people that just had minor cough or cold, but really didn't report it. Um, as we've discussed, you come out of the blocks with a disease that's never been reported. If you die, you're not going to miss that. If you just have a minor cold or allergy symptoms, you can miss it. And you may see that you may have already noticed um, there's an error in terms of it's 19% asymptomatic rate in, in Germany, according to that headline, not 15. So uh, the feature topic today is going to be silver linings of COVID-19. And my uh, lovely bride joined me today to talk about that. Janice, uh, you actually engineered this whole topic. You want to tell how you did that? Well, I had an engineer behind the engineer. Mm -hmm. My sister dropped about 15 uh, articles in our lap and she started looking up the benefits of COVID-19 and soon found that in the press, it's called the silver linings. And um, sounds like the old movie. Yep. Silver linings playbook, but it's COVID-19. And yep. Your sister's smarter than both of us put together. Don't you think? <laughs> yes. So uh, get us started. What's this about? Well, it covers many different areas that we'll talk about today. Some will be the medical, um, maybe not advantages, but the growth and changes that we'll make in the future. From a big picture, um, I don't know if we have a slide on it, but there's decreased seismic noise in the earth, which is typically only seen around Christmas when people stay inside. And I guess once they get where they're going, they're off the road in their home. And so, um, what fewer trains, fewer cars, fewer big trucks. Yeah. Just noise, you know, people staying at home. So we're seeing that and they're able to monitor, um, other very small events that usually don't even show up like small earthquakes, small, um, you know, volcanoes that are normally not even picked up. It has to be pretty big to overcome the noise that we're making. Yeah. On very this interesting. Earth. So Both then, of these images are, are dramatic. Yeah. So this one is the drop in air pollution, um, <clears throat> especially in China and Europe. A greenhouse gas emissions have been falling. Um, and then here in our country in Los Angeles, they are having a stretch of good air quality, which has not been seen since 1995. So the photo on the left is July 1998. And then clear skies, March 2020. Wow, amazing. So what's this about medical standards? Correct. So protocols and evolving medical standards are taking place right now. Um, and hopefully we'll see some of these into the future. I mean, I'm, in my list, which may not be on this and maybe it'll show up later on a slide, is that hopefully we'll have better testing, um, better um, quantity of PPE. Maybe we'll start using it on a more regular basis, like it's used in Asia. Speaking, uh, speaking of testing, I've heard a couple of times that the U.S. has now surpassed other countries in terms of the actual number of tests done. Have you heard that? I don't believe so. I haven't been able to confirm it. Clearly not in terms of rate per thousand, but absolute number, which, you know, obviously with 300 million, it's a large country, mm -hmm. but remains to be confirmed. They talk about telemedicine here. Any comments about that? Well, that is definitely evolving and something that I think will be retained in the future. You know, people, even, you know, as people are getting used to ho hosting their own Zoom meetings to see their relatives at home and have that connection, which is another silver lining 
right. the connectivity that we have with our families, with friends, they're becoming, they're, they're getting used to using technology. And, you know, I've seen people be very hesitant to join a Zoom meeting right now during COVID-19, but then you acquire a taste for it and you become quite capable. And so that will translate into medicine. And so, you know, a lot of doctors are offering services through telemedicine because patients don't want to have a face-to-face -face with doctors, um, you know, unless it's related to COVID-19 or to some very acute emergency. And as we mentioned a couple days ago, even China re reported retroactive data where patients were coming in far too late in the process of a cardiac event. That was Did I say patients? Patients yeah. were coming in far yeah. too late because of the fear of face Denying to face. Heart attack. Yeah, they didn't right. want to get COVID-19. So with all that, we're beginning to see the use of telemedicine for non-emergency care even specialists, I reported that earlier, maybe last week that I had met with a specialist who I had never met with. Um, so as a new patient myself, and so I think it's really, it's going to be really good for access to care. We've talked about disparities, you know, among access to care, we've seen the statistics um, where the poor definitely is showing up with more COVID-19. Right. And they, you know, the, the lifestyle, the poverty is a big problem. Also, we live in Kentucky. We have a lot of people living out in the country that don't have access to doctors unless, you know, U University of Kentucky is a, is a draw area from people all over Eastern Kentucky. Now, hopefully telemedicine, which was somewhat being offered will now become a cornerstone of our medical future. I, obviously, I've got a whole bunch of uh, personal agenda items. You had a personal experience with a doctor that agreed to use telemedicine. He was that offering, yeah, he was offering a specialist. Obviously, uh, you know, given my background and my history and what I do, I have a whole raft of stuff about telemedicine. One of the things I've shown is the um, is the U.S. map for no, number of uh, COVID cases, number of heart attack cases, and stroke deaths. And there's some places where stroke and heart attack deaths don't entirely correlate. And a lot of that appears to be due to what we call telestroke care. Now, telestroke care is very simple. It's major life-saving. It's been proven multiple times. And it's when the, uh, the EMS, the emergency medical systems, and the, uh, the emergency departments in the area can coordinate well enough to say, okay, you can call in with the EMS to one of our docs and we will go ahead and authorize clot busting medicines hmm. on the way in. And that's for rural areas. Um, and it greatly decreases mortality associated with stroke. It's not all over the country. And again, that's just one of these things where as a society, we are still struggling. We've been, still been struggling to, uh, to adapt the techno what technology is offering us. Mm -hmm. uh, and it costs lives. Yes. And I've, I've done a couple of my own videos where, Doc, I would love to see you, but I live in Connecticut. Well, and meanwhile, my cardiologist uh, wants to use high dose Lipitor and doesn't know that I've got insulin resistance. Right. And it's like, okay, I mean, you make your choice that you're not used to seeing a doc on telemedicine means, and that can very well cost you your life. It costs a lot of people their lives. And uh, you're right, it's, it's not just baby boomers, it's uh, lower socioeconomic groups as well. Right. Just not getting out there in terms of telemedicine yet. But this is pushing it in that direction and will end up saving a lot of lives. And I do wanna qualify, when people hear telemedicine, it, really can be as simple as a phone call. But yeah. then it can also be a Google meeting, a Zoom meeting. It's not always, not, not everybody wants to do a video meeting. Obviously, if you're trying to look at something, you know, say a dermato dermatology type presentation, right. but um, we practice all kinds of telemedicine. And then the other thing um, not to overlook is that you, 
have over 35 medical licenses right. or licenses in different states. So we're able to cover most of this country in our practice. Um, so that's an, and even internationally. And that's starting to sound like an advertisement. The bottom line is um, licenses don't really matter right now. Yeah. They've made changes with uh, most states are saying on emergency basis, pandemic basis, doctors can take uh, cases outside of their state. Yeah. And that's a good thing. And I expect that's going to be, that's been a major rate limiting step in well, terms that's why of telemedicine it in that's the past. What, it's been a deterrent. I'll, I'll be surprised if it doesn't continue to pave the way for getting over that state licensure issue. Right. Um, again, a lot of uh, lives being lost because of failure to use that. I want to point out the picture on this slide. Our health professionals are superheroes, the ones on the front lines dealing with COVID-19. The other changes currently affecting medical care right now are elective and non-urgent surgeries have been postponed to open up those beds. Um, and then physicians across specialties have joined in to help. And I think you mentioned the other day, anesthesiologists who intubate may be called in to help with the COVID-19 patients. So there's a lot of dedication of our healthcare workers right now. Ready to move on? Yes. Okay. To me, uh, you didn't have a, an art. You and Pam didn't have an article on this, but to me, this is one of our bigger items: pandemic preparedness. You know, uh, Ro uh, Michael Osterholm's book, uh, "The Deadliest Enemy," talks about things like we had uh, N95 face masks. They were only made in a couple of places in the world. Uh, for a while, it was only made in, in the Caribbean, and a hur one hurricane wiped out like all the plants and the whole, and it was a time when we needed it. Mm -hmm. And we still didn't get the point. Now we're starting to get the point. Making masks has become a cottage industry. You, you sent me some stuff, and James uh, talked with me yesterday. He's got a lot of folks uh, in the Amish community doing a lot of mask making. There's uh, a, there's gloves. A, yeah, I'm sorry. I was just going to say there's a big... Um, group in central central Ohio of Amish people making PPE for the Cleveland Clinic. And it's been all over the country. And here's the thing. We never really saw those as uh, safety or security critical industries before. That we always just approached it from an economic perspective. And economics had to do only with buying and selling and cost they didn't think about the cost of lives associated if you don't have this. That's not going to happen again no, for any it, of the PPE. And it's been available in other countries. I had a friend tell me that they were in Singapore getting ready to go somewhere where a volcano was erupting, and they walked in a store and bought an N95. Now, yeah. where, where would we do that here? So, again, it's, it's a cultural difference that we don't have that available to non-healthcare workers. Yeah. Uh, James is also, he's got some people going into, um, to, uh, oh, it's not, what, what's the name of that? Lowe's, into Lowe's to get these large um, uh, swatches, or what, what do you call these? Um, Tyvek? Bunches of Tyvek, big rolls of Tyvek, mm -hmm. taking them over to cottage industries, which are using, which have done uh, um, seamstress work in the past, and now they've gotten patterns for, gowns and they're making gowns out of Tibet. And we should so mention 3D house wrap. 3D printers are putting for out the, for the face face shields. Shields, yeah. Which reminds me the other day somebody mentioned plastic for face masks and I think they were referring to face shields. shields. That's a good point. I bet you're right. Um uh, speaking of people mentioning uh, people have mentioned a couple of things about covid attacking the heart or coronavirus attacking heart. I got to take a quick digression <laughs> on that. I've read up on that and there is a lot of buzz going on about that right now. Again, not going to be able to cover that during this event, but there's a lot of information. Bottom line at the end of the day is um, it may end up being a big deal. Uh, right now it's not because uh, again, there's a final common pathway in terms of heart and lung damage. That could um, be a future YouTube live. I'm sure, hopefully it will be. Um, so improve awareness to uh, surveillance techniques. We're going to be doing things a lot differently in terms of uh, watching for things. For example, coronavirus has been around for decades. It is endemic now in the Middle East. 
um, in the camel population. We're not going to change. It, it, camels are like horses in the West and, and other places in the world. And you're just not going to get rid of camels. And they're not going to get rid of coronavirus. So we are starting to become very much aware. And I don't think we're going to take lightly the next uh, potential coronavirus type of problem. Um, there are a bunch of coronaviruses out there. This is just one. This is one of three that has hit us so far with SARS and MERS being the other two. Well, and just we've been asked over and over, what is herd immunity? How yeah. many people would have that in their vocabulary a month ago? Very good Outside point. of epidemiologists. Very good point. So people have more education about what this means. And you hurt my feelings. I was full of myself <laughs> that I was able to do all the math in terms of yeah. R3 versus uh, R2. Let's not go back to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> antibiotic resistance uh, bugs. You know, the, the multiple antibiotic resistance uh, drugs, uh, bugs, the flesh eating bacteria and all these things. Uh, those may actually be a bigger issue for us long term than some of these viruses. And... Um, I think people are going to start taking it much more seriously. Mm -hmm. Big Im improvements in vaccine development, uh, DNA, RNA, uh, amino acid sequencing, that already happened this time. Within weeks, we had the sequencing. Uh, production and testing are really the big issues. Production is starting to ramp up dramatically. And I think we'll have better human testing. I think that, uh, again, we have some standards right now which are extremely conservative for uh, human uh, testing, market testing, aftermarket testing, basically for good reason, to look for things like um, uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, other problems associated with the virus itself, I mean, with the vaccine itself. Mm -hmm. um, another quick digression, there has been a couple of cases of uh, Guillain-Barre associated with the viral infection, not, mm -hmm. not the vaccine. But uh, back to this comment about vaccine human testing, I think as we continue to weigh the risks and deaths associated with wave two of coronavirus, uh, HSV2, or uh, coronavirus two, um, the, versus the risks of going ahead and deploying something that we would normally consider not quite ready. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to make some adjustments in that area. And I think that's a good well, thing. Well, that's, that's similar to the plasma infusions. Yeah. You know, they're not completely. Not quite ready for prime time, but they're, but they're using being them. Using, right, yeah. Exactly right. So uh, I think we're going to get better at saying, okay, we might not have met all of our conservative criteria in the past, but We've got a different benefit risk ratio now. Speaking of vaccines, there's new developments in technology. There's a company called Moderna, and uh, they have come out of the blocks. Big uh, stock play for those who like to play mar stock markets. Um, and they've never had a vaccine before, but they're coming out of the blocks. Big, big deal with coronavirus. One of the reasons is they have a totally different type of vaccine. So what they're using is the mRNA, messenger RNA, mm -hmm. the genetic material. So instead of going in and having millions of eggs and you implant something and have the egg grow the protein and put the protein or antigen in the, uh, in the, in the vaccine, inject it into the body, and, and depend on the human's immune system to find that antigen, that protein, react to it, all of that. This is a little bit different. What it is, is it, it goes ahead and sort of hijacks part of the human immune system and, and starts setting up. It bypasses the recognition. It bypasses these other components and does sort of like the virus in terms of coming in, setting up an RNA mechanism to where the... Um, you don't have to worry about recognition and all that. You just go ahead and start making the, the uh, antibody. Very, very interesting mm -hmm. uh, new technology. Uh, obviously has its risks, but um, a lot of opportunity. Um, uh, Fennell Hicks, I was talking with him earlier this week, and he, you know, he runs, he's got that program with, um, oh, what's the name of the company that does all that restaurant uh, 
supplies. I bet they're hurting right now. I don't know. Anyhow, it's a, um, oh, it's the same. There's a company with the same name. That Cisco. Makes, Cisco. I think it's Cisco. Uh, anyway, he's got a, uh, a contract with uh, one of these large uh, chains with multiple uh, factories. And basically what he does is he sets up um, uh, facilities for health coaching, for working out, fitness, lifestyle within the plant. Mm -hmm. And he was making the point. He said, yeah, that's my, those are my clients. But one of the things that they're doing is they're looking at expanding this because now they know more and more jobs in the economy are going to allow people to work at home. The, econ the economy is going to change dramatically. Obviously, that, that will help with child care. <laughs> it will help with child care. It will help with a lot of things. Uh, transportation costs, waste of hours a day in, in everybody's life, pollution, yeah. the, all the some of the things that we saw earlier. Obviously, it's tanking the economy right now and, and don't want to underestimate the, the damage that's being done. But again, there's going to be some uh maybe leaner meaner components to the economy in the future now did you read this article everybody ready for the big migration to online college actually no now that has been a big jumping off point it's been a big deal for people in the middle of the year who are not prepared to teach college or even public education elementary through high school online but they are doing such a good job you know the teachers and the professor. remote teaching. Yes, they are Actually. working so hard at that. And even, you know, showing not just teaching, but compassion for their students, engaging them in Lexington. Uh, one elementary school had a parade of teachers go down the street through all their neighborhoods in their different individual cars mm -hmm. with, so, with physical distancing amongst the teachers. Some teachers have shown up outside the door where student is struggling with math and have stood there with a whiteboard with the glass door between them demonstrating um i've talked to professors you know they're they're teaching but they're also messaging and having contact with students individually to see how they are because again some student, some university students didn't even have computers. Number one, I mean, again, we have to think about disparities. I read an article about Harvard where one student went to her second home in Maine to do her uh, online classes. The other went back to Florida to work at Taqueria, which was failing mm -hmm. because they couldn't access meat. So, I think the professors are very cognizant of the state of affairs in each individual student life so my kudos to our teachers and professors yeah you're dealing a lot of the stuff that you're dealing with has to do with that first bullet point here we have tended to assume uh, uh, digital and remote school has been it's been a huge improvement in access but it's been snake bit it's been very difficult to get people to finish and I, I had the same problem I didn't finish my uh, some of my genetics work uh, at Stanford just because life got in the way and if you've got a structure around uh, getting up, going to school, it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. You can, one you of can the, build that in, though, because our, our, our daughter's currently teaching in Santiago, Chile, her first time teaching university. And one of the tools she has used is ha because she can't check attendance because the connectivity is not always good. So not everybody can get into the live Zoom. She records it but then she gives homework to assess attendance. Right. And that's, that's part of, I think what part of the problems have been, you look at some things like school and one of the major challenges has been the assumption that it just needs to be a broadcast, you know, like a show and it's all pitching and no, inter no interaction, no catching, no question, you know, right. none of that stuff. Accountability. No Account accountability and inter human interaction, no one-on-one -on -one interaction. Right. And then, what you're the a lot of the examples you're bringing up are like the lady standing outside the door with the whiteboard. That's still one on one, mm -hmm. but there's it's got re components of remote and it. and it has components of personal personal commitment, con con connectivity, and, and accountability, compassion. and compassion. compassion and accountability. This student was crying about the inability to get her math homework. Yep. Anything else on this? Uh. 
No, I mean, the last bullet point, I think we've all seen musicians are conducting performances and shows online free to the public right now. There's yep. been Broadway shows, there's been symphonies, philharmonics, all kinds of things that have been um, opera at our disposal. And I would say that's not new. That's the essence of YouTube. Well, but it's new that it's available. Not everyone can go to the Met Opera, but yeah. now it's available. Yeah, in the past, it was all the, the higher quality, the higher end stuff was not uh, quite so readily available on YouTube because people wanted right. you to come to New York and pay mega bucks. And again, 150 so bucks for a ticket to go into the. Right. Show. And children living in poverty have never been to the San Diego Zoo yeah. or some aquarium. And now there's really interesting now they broadcasts. Are. That sort of reminds me of uh, Lion King. I mean, uh, Tiger King. But I won't go there. I'm not watching that. <laughs> not the digression. <laughs> I've got better you know, things that, to do with my time. <laughs> that, that hit the news. Well, that hit the news. That somebody was asking Trump about pardoning that guy. And it's like, oh, my Lord. So more silver linings. Uh, you want to talk about this one? Well. Traffic congestion. I mean, some of this is... Uh, Related to some of the things that we saw before, less traffic congestion, empty streets. Not well, big... I like the decreased accidents, and I'm yeah. sure we'll see the data on traffic accidents, traffic mortalities decrease. But again, major, major impact on the community, major impact on health uh, associated with this. But that's the bullet not point. the silver lining. People around the world are doing nice things for each other. And yeah. we've seen many examples of this in social media. I've mentioned a couple of them. And as we said, face-to-face, -face, oh, they'll understand the true value of face-to-face -face meeting. Another big thing people <laughs> are doing right now is really, you know, when you're confined inside all day, well, we're not confined by any means compared to other countries. And I like to qualify that because everybody is bereft that their life has changed so much but some countries you can't go out um, yeah. to take a walk. But when we do go out, I think there's a huge appreciation of nature in our environment and seeing things we never took the time to see. And I'm trying to teach you that value. <laughs> That's why I'm instead smiling. Of talk, instead of talking about the next YouTube Live while we're walking, I'll be like, uh, you can go out and walk with me if you will be an observer today. <laughs> That's why I'm laughing because I'm still not understanding the true value of face-to-face -face meetings. I mean, and you and I have talked about it. I traveled for like almost 30 years for a living. And uh, for over a decade, it was I was in the home, my hometown maybe three days a month. It just way too much travel. And so now that I've retired and I'm doing things uh, remotely, I love it. I, well, it uh, might not mean purely business meetings. It may yeah. mean seeing their relatives. I'm sure you would be glad to Zoom with me every day. Well, you know, <laughs> uh, to me, it was, uh, we, we talked about making that trip over to see Jeffrey and uh, Raven. Yeah. I uh, I was totally comfortable Zooming them. Well. FaceTime. And that's them. you. Yeah, but that's a, lot, a lot of people do miss that face-to-face -face contact. And I will at some point, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I was. That's what I was saying. If I was quarantined, I'm sure you'd be glad to just have Zoom meetings with me. I could do that. Okay, anything else about life, simple pleasures, food, recipes? I made up a good yes. recipe today. Yes, you did. You want to describe it? Cauliflower with a little bit of cheese, a little bit of avocado oil, a little bit of bacon flavoring in that uh, avocado oil, a little bit of um, uh, olive oil-based um, um, margarine taste to it. It was like a stuffed... Baked potato, but it was cauliflower rice, correct? Right. But I think that even that trying super healthy recipes and home cooked meals, I've leaned on my sisters, my daughter, my son's girlfriend, people I do Tai Chi with to, to cook new recipes. But I like this one quote from Amy here. We saw our youngest kids' first steps. Think about how many parents miss that while they're uh, away from deal. work. That's a big deal. Big, big deal. Um, so I like that one and people that that's another good one below that Caitlin 
people are enjoying the outdoors without looking at their phones. Yeah. Yeah, you do. Appreciate, I tell you what, I do appreciate going outdoors more than I used to. And I will appreciate it when it, if I can ever start going back to the Y. Well, and that's another connectivity is that many of these exercise places are offering. I, I attend two live Pilates classes at the Y every week. And I don't know, it's kind of more enjoyable than a re I've never really done <laughs> recorded classes or viewed videos, but now I'm doing these live classes. Yeah, I should have shown the picture of uh, you. Don't, I walked, don't bother. <laughs> <laughs> I walked in. I walked in yesterday, and she was laying on her side on the floor doing a Pilates move. She had the uh, iPad. iPad balanced in front of her on a little iPad thing, which our dog was blocking. And we had our little dog sitting in front of that because uh, Ozzy thought that was a great a great thing to do. So. Uh, Derek and Sarah Neve, thank you very much for uh, a contribution. For those of you who ha have an interest, basically any contributions going to help us get this information out, uh, medical information, public health information, and mostly preventive medicine information, uh, s mostly specific to uh, baby boomers, the things that are killing and disabling uh, baby boomers early. Uh, and there's several ways to do that. Uh, Carl will go ahead and maybe make that uh, available. Carl, if you could put some of that up on the screen, some instructions on how to do that. And again, it makes a big, big difference. We've been supporting this out of our uh, retirement. I was supporting it out of um, my day job earlier, and uh, I'm supporting it out of seeing patients now. Uh, Doug Thompson, good morning, Ford. Let's see if I can make show this up. Good morning, Ford, and thanks for all the kind comments from yesterday. Well, you're very welcome, Doug. Thank you for for uh, sharing with us your skills and your information regarding oral health, gum disease, and the connection but, uh, between that and heart disease. It's, there's no question in many of our minds now, and there's research indicating that it's not just that diabetes causes both gum disease and heart disease. Gum disease can cause the other two things. And that's why I use my little picks now. I don't know if you can see these. So soft picks, uh, fastidious about gum care now. Greg, Greg Clopton, good morning. Hopefully technology is gonna work. Uh, good to see you, Nancy Dubrozic from Tampa. Uh, Derek and Sarah, Sarah Neve, greetings from France. Very good. Uh, you guys are, uh, the French are having some challenges, just like uh, the U.S. right now, I think. Maybe not as bad. Nancy Bro Debrozic, uh, Debozic, OMG, please, now ivermectin will be restricted. We use it on livestock regularly, and we're not restricted in being able to purchase it. Yeah, you know, that's a good point. That's what my sister said. She uses it on her dogs, on her dogs. For worms. Yeah, and heartworms. And it's and, over the counter. Right. And there's might be a run on that for a while. Man, sure. How close are we to an antibody test? You know, I was discussing, don't know how far and how, how deep to get into that. There, There's some that are, uh, that have uh, EUA, emergency use acknowledgement or something. It, it's an FDA term. Uh, but there are some antibody tests out there now. Uh, we were offered access to a couple of million of them earlier this week. Where that ended up, I don't know. But I, it, that's going to start happening, Main sure. It's a great question. And again, it's something we really need. Um, we are also talking with a, a large, very large employer, about a quarter of a million people in the UK, a uh, financial group that uh, because they're in finance, there are able to quickly get people out of the office and working at home. But the problem's gonna be getting all those people back into the office. And an antibody test is gonna be critical to that next phase of managing this, uh, this pandemic. Sarah Furman, after I come back from going out in public, I wash my hands and face, and Janice tells me to do that too. Uh, she will not, she's pretty adamant about that. Then when, I breathe. When, when he did not do that last night, I used a paper towel to hold his tan hand while we watched Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> then I breathe in hot steam to clean mouth, nose, and lungs. In using the steamer, a 
is using the steamer a waste of time or is it a good idea? Well, as you can tell from Janice's comment, I'm a little bit I'm a little bit of a skeptic regarding use of a steamer. That's just my opinion. I haven't read anything about it. I haven't read anything either. Uh, and then you know, Brad put out a video about uh, doing this navage nasal lavage with three percent saline solution, mm -hmm. and that's the only place I've seen that too. And to me, it, it's like. I'm not, I, I'm not, I don't think it's right. My guess is it's not ready for prime time either. Well, the CDC recommends washing the face mask each time you go out. Yeah. So I think that would include hand washing. No argument about hand washing. And it, it, I was running. I wasn't. Anyway, <laughs> Mike Just, hi from two, from Toto's land, Kansas. I don't know if we've had anybody at least admit oh, they were from Kansas. <laughs> Uh, Jerry West, I had several N95 masks. You still haven't acknowledged any relationship to the to that Jerry West. I had several N95 masks in my garden supplies, bought them along with eye protection at Home Depot for use while spraying insecticide. Good for you. Uh, hopefully they're the kind you can wash and reuse. Robin Ray, do you have any, any left? Now see where that jumped? Uh, Derek and Sarah, Sarah Neve, those are pounds, by the way. Thanks for what you're doing, Ford. Uh, thank you for the contribution, uh, Derek and, and Sarah. And I don't know what the exchange rate is. Somebody put 250 a while back, and I thought, gosh, we'd hit the jackpot, but it was 250 crumbs. Oh, those are euro. Are those euros? Oh, that's euros. That's not pounds. A year ago, they were about one to one. I but thanks anyway. It's it, it's more it's more than the thought that counts, but the thought counts too. I mean, the the thought is a huge deal. Jerry West, I brought the mask to the clinic where I work because we were out. Well, evidently you're not that Jerry West. You're in our. <laughs> what were you hoping? He was a basketball player. Uh, yeah, Jerry West was like <laughs> he was. He finally West answered Virginia your question. and L.A. and a whole bunch. Okay, so Ron Clark, DNA manipulation. I, do you understand what he's saying? I no. don't. Uh, Greg Clopton, AR VR will be certain will certainly contribute to the value of remote contact. Alternate reality, virtual reality. Uh, I don't like alternate reality. Jim Hyde, I think the U.S. will be more independent relative to manufacturing. Absolutely, especially in terms of PPE and medicines. Yeah, big deal. Um, you know what? There's a whole bunch. Uh, India, for example, is a capital of the uh, economy for um, uh, oh generic medications. And there are big questions right now when generic medications, for example, generic Plaquenil might be used, whether or not we're going to be able to get those from our sources. It's great spending more time in conversing with my life and family. Same here. Amazon. Hi. I... Uh, after my bad experience with Kroger, I'm a, I've gone back to Amazon too. I did a lot more shopping on Amazon this morning. My wife and I had Kroger delivery to our home twice. Both times they arrived within 10 minutes and delivered a couple of hundred dollars. And there were only a few items. Okay, don't go down that bunny trail about your Kroger experience. <laughs> that I talked to the kids. Uh, our son works at Kroger <laughs> and uh, his girlfriend Raven has worked at Kroger for years. And they both picked up immediately. They said, you know what? They, pro they probably brought in kids because they, uh, they were getting slammed. It was chaos. They didn't train them adequately. The kids, you know, were doing the best they could. You shouldn't have told me not to go there. But the kids understood exactly. Uh, the kids, our son, who's in his mid-20s, and his girlfriend, who's in, in the The stores are doing the best they can. They've been overwhelmed I don't think, hoarding. I think they could do a lot better. Uh, hi from North well, Georgia. You did eat four jellos within 24 hours, <laughs> and you only received four. Well, was so she, part of it is it was pent up jello staging <laughs> your food. Hi Nick. I'm going to have to leave. I have another appointment at 12. Uh, okay. Well, you might want to hit, read that oh, comment okay. before you leave. Thank you. I'll take that. It's nice to see <laughs> your pretty daughter joining you. Oh boy, I'm not going to hear the end of that. <laughs> Okay, thank you, baby. Okay. We'll see you.
Okay, Susan, Col Susan Colander, connectivity in rural and remote areas is still assumed for distance learning. It does not exist everywhere, nor is it easily or quickly going to become available. So, so true. Clemp dim dim jigen. I am hearing that tests are scarce, and if you get a test, it's six weeks out for results. I don't think it's that far out for results, but the tests are still scarce. You know, the this statement that there may be more tests done in the U.S. by now, overall, again, it's not per capita. Nowhere near catching up per capita. Uh, no results, no treatment, and and in fact, no results, no knowledge of where the virus is, no knowledge of where the outbreaks are, no knowledge of where the uh, clusters are, no knowledge of where the transmission's going on. So guess what? We're trying to manage this in a vacuum. We're flying blind until we get up and rolling. Fennell, I don't know if you heard, I was just talking about you. Uh, major, major organization that will benefit from COVID-19 experience is the Veterans Administration. For years, they've been trying to see our vets via telemedicine. It will be easier now after this. Absolutely. Thanks for joining in for now. And good to see you again. And I hope I didn't misquote you earlier. Antonio Augusto Orselli. Good morning, Dr. Brewer. Does vitamin D really help prevent the infection? My level is currently 65. Greetings from Brazil. I've got uh, some patients in Brazil. Um, I don't think anybody knows for sure whether vitamin D actually prevents it. There's significant evidence that vitamin D does uh, slow down and prevent uh, diabetes and prediabetes. And um, as I think one of the things that, that has been seen time and again is it's not so much, and maybe I'm mis misstating, I'm not, I haven't seen anything in the scientific evidence that would say that having diabetes makes you more likely to get infected, but having diabetes and prediabetes makes it much more likely for you to have very serious COVID-19, the disease, the serious disease, once you do get infected. So I, that's where that, that's, uh, it's a logical transition, uh, Mr. Orselli. Thank you for the question. I think it was very, a very good one. Susan Collender, we had a good experience with grocery pickup at Meyer yesterday. Well, thank you for sharing that. And again, I, I was, uh, Janice was probably right. I'm not gonna say that in front of her. And I hope she doesn't see the rest of this video, but she was probably right. I was probably being too unkind with uh, Kroger and too demanding. There were a couple of reasons. Number one, it had been a month since I had shopped for any of my foods. So I had a little pent up as she, she outed me there. I had, I had three of my four little cups of sugar-free jello that it had been a long time. So <laughs> I had some emotion, but again, I worked for Kroger for a couple of years and I had, you know, I had my own baggage, my own disappointment with, uh, some, uh, process related issues, which the kids picked up on. I keep saying this, Jeffrey and Raven keep pick, picked up on immediately. How can uh, the, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce C-L-M-T-D-M-M-M-J-C-M-M, but how can South Korea test basically everyone and we cannot get tests? I've been asking that same question for a month now. It is very frustrating. If you go back and you look at, you read an article and Janice talked about it, Pam shared it as usual. That's what our mechanism is turning into now. Pam reads all this stuff, just reads everything. When she finds something interesting, she ships it to Janice. Janice then finds it and ships it to me and I start trying to get it into our, uh, our slide decks and then I read it. Um, now Janice has developed another significant uh, component in our process. She's getting the deck over to Chris. So Chris can, has made the deck for today. Actually, that was the first time we did it that way. And it was a huge relief for me. Um, and which is a good thing because I was getting burnt. Um, but back to the, uh, to the test, I just don't understand why it has taken us so long. 
if you go back and you the article I was referring to that uh, Pam sent was the article about I, I don't remember the exact keywords, but it was the New England Patriots jet picked up like a couple of million face masks. And there were just incredible challenges. There were challenges on the custom side in China and challenges on the custom side in the US. For example, they had three hours in China for the pilots to land, pick up their, their, the masks and get out of there, or they were gonna quarantine them and not let them leave. Three hours. Well, once they got in, they found they had to do some count and some quality check to make sure that they were actually picking up two million, two million masks. Then they started finding problems with the count. Uh, and so you start to get an understanding of why it has been so difficult to get um, these tests. And I can tell you again, uh, in working to set that up for uh, for our governor's office, which has not happened. Um, our procurement guy, I mean, he was reminded, our, our procurement uh, guy is really good. His, uh, his name is General Les Carroll, and he was, a, the, the name is not general. He was a general for the U.S. Armed Forces in Afghanistan in charge of logistics and procurement there. And he, he told a story once, he said, they had a, they were trying to pick up a thing called a, find a, a truck called a low boy, and it was used to transport some big, big other truck or rocket carrier or something. It was just, then they were amazed that there were like 30 or 40 low boys available in that small area. And then they started looking at, so they asked for pictures and they started looking at the pictures of all these low boys that were out there. And they noticed that it was all the same low boy with different magnetic signs on the doors. And that was exactly what was going on for the past month in terms of tests, uh, masks, gloves, uh, face shields, uh, gowns, all of this. Well, I've got half a million of them. They're the ones being used in, uh, in uh, South Korea. He wants his money now and he's about, and so you go back and forth we can't give you the money immediately. There's got to be some quality check on delivery, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, well, and now it's gone. Okay, we're going to pull the trigger. We're going to buy this. Oh, now it's gone. We sold it to somebody else. And it's like very frustrating. Okay, CLMTM, TDMM, JCM says, just call me C. Thank you very much, C. That's much simpler. Kudos, C. I agree. What sweetener do you buy with your Jello? Um, as you may know, I'm a, I, I, I've shared it several times. I've got a sweets addiction. Um, I've made more progress in that sweets addiction in the past six months than ever before in my whole life. I used to be like a diet Coke addict and, you know, people would cringe and say, Oh, that's so bad for you. I was a skeptic and up until a year or so ago. And so anyway, um, the thing that I use to make a lot of progress on my sweets addiction is stuff called Jim Nima. Um, G Y M N E M A. I'm blanking on the last name. There's two names to it. Jim Nima, Jim Nima blank. Um, and it actually, it, it impacts you centrally in terms of your uh, nervous system, but uh, also in your GI tract, but even mo more importantly in the, uh, palate, the back, the palate, the back of the palate, and the back of the tongue, where you have sweets receptors. Gymnema actually coats those areas, um, so you get to where you don't taste the sweet part of stuff. And so, for example, if you take gym, if you're a diet coke addict, for example, and you take gymnema, and then you try the diet coke, it tastes like metal. And it just, you don't taste the sweet, you just taste the rest of it, which is not good. So just a couple of comments about uh, sugar substitutes. Now there's another one, Aura Ruth. Uh, Aura Ruth, one of our commenters, sent me some stuff called uh, Palladina. 
or Paladrina from uh, Israel. It was in uh, Israeli script. It's actually a type of sugar that um, takes hours to digest. So it's very low, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Low, low glycemic, Paladrina. Um, and what I do right now with lemonade, for example, I make lemonade with these little squeeze bottles of lemon juice, uh, cold water, and a pack, tiny single serving of that Paladrina and a little bit of erythritol. So it's, um, it's very good. I'm, I'm getting over one of the silver linings for me personally out of the, uh, COVID a lockdown is that I'm breaking my uh, diet coke addiction. Janice Derrickson, thank you, Chris, for developing the slide deck. So she made a, she left and made a nice little comment. C, do you have a video link for your rec recommended treatment for prediabetes and diabetes? Well, if you go to our website, in fact, what I'll do is I'll share this real quick because this is life saving stuff. Um, you may consider it an advertisement, but I mean, it's an advertisement for some life saving things. And again, we're not making uh, personal money on that. We're taking, putting all of it back. So what you do is you go to our website. Um, I'm Doc yet to share your screen. I hit share three or four times and it didn't. Thank you, Carl, for being aware and for making me aware. Uh, so, you go to PrevMed Heart Risk. As you see, this is still sort of an old style, ugly, lots of red, lots of dark colors. We're improving that, but please ignore that for right now. Uh, and you can go in. Here's one of the most popular things that we're doing right now. It's We call it a webinar. It's actually been a series of three webinars. Um, and what you can do is this. It's more than just a webinar. If you want to get a couple of tests that doctors just don't order, an inflammation panel, and in insulin resistance tests, uh, OGTT, oral glucose tolerance tests, and IR, insulin response. So what that'll do is, first of all, tell you whether or not you've got inflammation to your arteries associated with this process. And over 80% of us that have uh, plaque, the major cause of it is insulin resistance or prediabetes. Most people think they don't have it. Um, the CDC in back more conservative days was saying 30% uh, of adults, as in 80 million adult Americans have this, but only 8 million know about it. And it's burning your arteries. It causes strokes. It causes heart attacks. It causes blindness. Uh, it causes kidney disease and it causes inflammation. So you can, first of all, test to see if you have inflammation, but even more importantly, test to see if you have insulin resistance or prediabetes. Now, what you do is you fast for eight hours, you uh, go in, you get a fasting glucose and a fasting insulin value. You take that sugary sweet fructose, uh, sucrose or fructose, I can't remember. And I know they're very different. I I think it's sucrose, but anyhow, it's 75 grams of uh, glucose in a cola. Then you take a, uh, a blood sugar and an insulin one hour later and a blood sugar and an insulin value two hours later. Optimum values would be uh, a blood sugar in the 80s when you're fasting, uh, peaking at no more than 120 and then coming back down to a hundred or less at, at two hours. Uh, we will typically get people in their 40s, 50s, 60s and above. And the older you are, the more likely you are to have uh, peak values up around uh, 160, 180, well over 200. We've had several of them, 300, 350. Um, and once you get past 200 any time, that's not prediabetes anymore, it's officially diabetes. And uh, if you watch the comments on this channel, people will say, gosh, doc, I took your test. I just went out and got it myself and I don't have prediabetes. I've got full-blown diabetes. And guess what? My doc's been saying I'm fine. He's been checking me every year. 
Well, what your doc has been checking is hemoglobin A1C, and the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists are, are very clear. That's not a good test for ruling out diabetes. And they're right, it's not. Uh, and that's why we continue to see people that did not know that they had prediabetes or diabetes. And it's because their doc was depending on um, hemoglobin A1C. Now, the appropriate numbers for, um, for uh, insulin are a fasting or basal insulin of five or less, uh, peaking at 50 or less, and uh, coming back down to 20 or less. And what we will often see, it, it took a long time for us to be able to, to get the lab to do the insulin values with us, but they did. And here's what I'll typically see, about two patients per month will come in, they'll have great, or maybe not too bad, glucose numbers uh, in the 90s maybe, and then peaking at 150, 140. But then you look and their insulin values are going up to 125, 150. I had a patient just yesterday who had um, blood sugar went up to 230 and the insulin value went up to 130. So he had full-blown diabetes, but as you could tell from looking at that number, it wasn't that he had totally burned his pancreas out. He wasn't uh, where he didn't have any, his pancreas was not creating any insulin. He was still creating insulin, but um, so, um, but it was taking way too much and it was still ineffective in managing his glucose. So uh, there's a good news, bad news situation. Yes, the bad news is you've got uh, uh, full-blown diabetes. The good news is you're still making insulin. So you start doing things and I have, I'll typically have patients with full-blown diabetes that never end up going on insulin. I mean, that's just, that's standard. If you go back and look at uh, CDC and other places that uh, have the same thing, they talk about very few people uh, with type two diabetes ever end up needing insulin. And you can reverse the problem. Amazon, can't the US buy the testing material from Korea? Uh, years ago, I bought lots of shoes from Korea. The old shoemakers should just make and sell the US the testing material. I understand. Uh, and I've asked the same question. Why is it so difficult? It's like, for those of you who've seen the play, Waiting for Godot. Uh, Lance H., I have worked at Walmart for the last 13 years, and I can tell you they do not put the customer first. Well, I don't think I would ever say that they do either. There's several reasons for this. Not enough time to explain here in a brief fashion. Um, yeah, I don't think Walmart approach to the market was ever putting the customer first, ever. I've never heard that. Uh, George Farsley, thanks for all the info. You've talked about K2 and vitamin T D separately. I've heard that there's a synergy between them. Your thoughts? Yes, I do have thoughts on that. K2 is one of my favorite topics. Um, Aura Ruth and some others, for example, said, Doc, you got way too geeky on K2. H here's the issue. Because both of them have to do with calcium uh, metabolism, people tend to think you got to take K2 and D3 uh, together. And you find a lot of those supplements where they are given together. Here's the thing. Um, they, it, they say that K2 takes the calcium out of your arteries and puts it back in your bone. I don't think it's quite that simple. Um, K2... Uh, again, if you read it and you look at the actual clinical trials, they're not that uh, convincing, but it's one of those things like that earlier question uh, where it's clinical trials haven't been done or not many of them. Um, the Rotterdam study, I think, was one of the key ones that most people uh, depend on for K2. But there's some logic trial uh, issues, and there's actually been a, a clinical trial as well, which supports my perspective. If you go back and look at the science behind K2, K2 uh, is involved in um, a couple of the enzymes 
in activating a couple of the enzymes that actually do impact calcium uh, metabolism, to take calcium out of bones uh, or in, put calcium back in bones. Uh, osteocalcin is the name of one of them, and I can't remember the name of the other one. It's an acronym. Um, but now, where am I going with all this? I think it's a little bit more complicated than just managing calcium. I think what happens in the, at the end of the day is that these enzymes are linked with improvement of insulin resistance, prediabetes. And I mentioned that I'd actually seen one of these studies, and I have. I've seen a, a clinical trial where they took some relatively young, insulin-resistant, prediabetic men. They put them on high doses, uh, three and four times the amount um, of uh, K2. I think the normal is, I think it's in... Um, the units is my, uh, micrograms, and it's usually like 100 micrograms, and they were using like three and 400. And they actually did get reversal of prediabetes in those young men based on a clinical trial of vitamin K2, high dose. I think that's really what's going on. But again, as you can see, I get real geeky and maybe hard to follow on that issue. C, treatment for insulin resistance, uh, lifestyle, 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 and then there's some other, you know, supplements and medications. Uh, sleep is a big, big deal, uninterrupted, uh, good, deep sleep. Um, by far, the most, the biggest deal is diet and weight. We used to think that uh, subcutaneous fat, you know, these saddlebags were, um, that fat was inert. Uh, energy storage tissue. It's not. It is very active endocrine tissue and it creates uh, adipokines and other things, hormones that cause prediabetes. So as we age, we've got to get very, very adamant about managing and decreasing our body fat. There's also other things about fat. It, the, it, that body fat uh, goes from normal sub Q subcutaneous to um, uh, uh, peri-organic, um, I mean, um, it's located in different places. One is around the, the organs of the abdomen. The other one is inside muscle tissue. And uh, that leads to one of, the, one of the drug treatments. There are several different drug treatments. Most common is uh, metformin. Another one is pioglitazone. And one of the things that you find with pioglitazone is that it takes the fat that's been located inappropriately in the muscle tissue, where you'll see, for example, marbling in cattle, uh, or beef, it takes it out of that muscle tissue and puts it back in a subcutaneous uh, distribution. So there's a lot to it. Three times, uh, lifestyle is three times uh, more important than any kind of medication, any kind of surgery, any kind of supplements. Lance H, just like for COVID-19, if you don't test for high glucose, you don't, a really good point. And it's called test, don't guess. No one is, is chattering in the news about glucose testing, I know. And that, it, so great point, Lance. The government should provide free glucose monitors for everyone. I agree with that. And not only do they not provide free glucose monitors, they make it even more difficult by saying you have to get a prescription for it. And so that's one of my other pet peeves. We've got a program to provide uh, prescriptions for glucose monitors, um, the continuous glucose monitors. You can you can get regular finger stick glucose monitors with uh, without a prescription. Um, but you are so right. Uh, tests don't guess. We're flying blind and you don't feel high blood sugar the vast majority of the times. You don't feel your arteries burning. You don't feel the development of plaque. And the first thing that most people find out about having plaque is the half the people that find out they have a heart attack find out by dying. So this is not, um, it, it's a great, it's a great point that you connect this to COVID-19 because 
again, it's COVID-19 is like heart attack and stroke in this, in this point. It's not, it's not the virus that's killing you. It's having prediabetes or diabetes and the other uh, comorbidities that have impacted your immune system. So when you get this virus, you can't manage it. And that's what kills you. So when you start thinking about heart attacks are really a diabetes problem, you know, you could go back. We we've had a lot of conversation about coding and miscoding. If you think about it, the vast majority of heart attacks are caused by prediabetes. The vast majority of strokes are caused by prediabetes. How many death certificates have for a heart attack have prediabetes instead of heart attack? The original cause was the prediabetes. How many death certificates for stroke have, or codes for stroke disability have prediabetes as the cause? How many death certificates for COVID are gonna have prediabetes? in the code. Thanks for listening to my rant. C, Lance H, that would be great. Joseph, my wife drinks plenty of Diet Coke. Why did you stop drinking it? Well, there's been continued evidence indicating that these sweeteners may actually cause uh, prediabetes or diabetes. And I never, I, I kept an eye on those because of my own addictions. And I actually, just a few months ago, saw the first, it was a clinical trial where they uh, looked at, uh, I can't remember which one of the sweeteners, it's the one of them that's used in Diet Coke, but it was, I don't think it was aspartame. Um, they looked at use of that sweetener alone, use of glucose alone, and use of um, nothing, and then use of glucose and the sweetener together. And what they found was, if people were using both the glucose and the sweetener, that was actually driving insulin resistance. It was as if it was having some sort of impact on the insulin receptor. So those of us who, who drink diet soft drinks, are you very comfortable that you never get any other source of glucose, in the, including you never eat any grains, you never eat any breads or pastas, you're totally keep ketogenic all the time, except, uh, um, and the only sweets you get are those. If you're not, then again, there's very good evidence that this may actually be uh, creating some of that insulin resistance. So I'd been wanting to, I'd been feeling guilty about it, wanting to get rid of it. So. That was enough to make me go ahead and start pushing that issue. Thank you again for your interest today. We've gone a little bit long, and I think part of the reason is we got into a topic that's near to and dear to my heart. It's what this whole channel is about, and that is helping people begin to get aware of the real pandemic, the, the real thing that's killing us, and it's prediabetes. Very boring topic. Nobody wants to hear about it but it's what's killing us. Thank you for your interest. Thank you, 